This is the Improv Chronicle podcast. I'm Lloydie. It's Tuesday, 2nd June, 2020. During a global pandemic, improv has suddenly got mainstream exposure through a Netflix series. Middle Ditch and Schwartz's three-part special has got people talking about the art form and has got improvisers talking about duos. Last episode, you heard why a duo is different to being in an ensemble show. In the second of two episodes about two-person improv, you're going to hear improvisers getting to the heart of why they think being in a duo is so special for them and their audiences. That's after dealing with some of the mechanics of duo work first, starting with Chicago improviser and Second City teacher, Rachel Mason. Oh, the biggest question I always get is how first is how do we edit? <laughs> <laughs> and, and second, how do we multi-role? And I think, like you said, like your group has to figure it out. Is that a tool you're going to break out? Why are you going to break it out? Do you understand it has different uses? Like, like I said, TJ and Dave will frequently use it like to show off a breadth of character, uh, to introduce new information, Um, like it's, you know, they don't do more than four scenes and they typically don't play more than two or three characters each. Me and Susan could play a hundred characters in one scene. So how do Chicago duo TJ and Dave approach having multiple characters in their show? David Pasquese. We decided to play other people as they were needed, not as a task that we had to have other people. Sometimes we don't. Um, or sometimes there's very few, there's nothing that determines why we're playing others except for seemingly, uh, a need or that, oh, there would be a person there. If we have been in this space for this long, someone else would be here. Again, it's responding honestly to, uh, given everything that we've established up until this point. So how do you differentiate those characters in the audience's mind and your own? Well, um, I think one of the helpful bits is to give each one a certain mindset, but also a certain physicality. So that's easier for everyone to distinguish. It's just a shorthand. So when this, you know, you see a person uh, making a particular specific gesture, oh, now that I know that's that person that we saw before. And the hard part, the easy part is the physicality. The hard part is to try to think like these different people. And that's not as easy. I mean, if I'm the same person and all of a sudden I start speaking about a certain thing a different way, I might be the same guy. I might be the new person. So the physicality is the most helpful to d- differentiate, I think, in a shorthand. And and moving on to like how you like edit or transition into another scene. I know... Uh, Newer improvisers going into a duo certainly seem to have that as one of their main conversations that they have. Um, how do you approach transitioning to a, to a new scene? And again, it's it's what seems to be needed or what seems to um, be organic. Sometimes to edit is to give yourself a a way out, and that's not what we're after either. We're not attempting to make it the easiest on us. So sometimes if you're sitting in a difficult situation, we'll just sit there and there won't be any talking. It'll just be a difficult situation. And a lot of times, maybe earlier on, I would have been uncomfortable in that and looked forward to editing and getting out of that situation. But um, we sometimes enjoy trying to work our way through seemingly impossible situations. Over to the UK and London duo Derek's Mojo. We met Monica and Jody Ann last week. So how do they approach the technicalities of editing a multi-rolling? I would say with editing, we've got a a format. So we understand that we're moving on to the, um, the next part of the story or we're going on to different characters. But for us, it's really just a diet. A, um, a dynamic change or a beat change and you realize oh this is something else now and I think for I think we've always just thought it doesn't matter if the audit it takes the audience a couple of seconds to pick up that this is something different now because that's that's okay it's okay that it's not an instant an instant thing yeah we very much feel when when as Monica says when there's a beat change when there's a shift and quite often times you know our stories don't 
don't end on a laugh or a big gag or a big cathartic moment. Sometimes we'll be telling a one of our little stories and it, the story will just end. It will just run out of steam. It will reach its natural conclusion. It can be a very soft landing sometimes. And we just move on to the mm. next thing. Just, just go on to the next rather than, um, you know, forcing the story till we get to that high point and then we can we can edit. Um, we just we just call it quits and move on to the next thing. Um, self editing is something that we're very good at. I think we just find a natural place. And when we stop the story to talk to the audience, when we kind of feel that we've reached a natural place where oh, there's an issue here. This is a point when we take it to the audience and ask them what they think. Yeah. And um, when it comes one? to playing different characters, oh, yeah. it's definitely in physicality, it's definitely mm. um, uh, vocals, and it's definitely, for want of a better word, just vibe as well. <laughs> or just like this person, this, we know this person is different because one, they changed their physicality, or and their vocals, or and they've also moved somewhere else in the state, on the stage as well, which is a nice way of being like oh the person standing over there speaking like that is this character but when they stand over there it's another character as well I remember the very first time I formed a duo we worked on a super complex format we got really into it as a duo we don't do that format anymore and we feel all the better for it so I put the idea of how much formatic requirement two person shows need to New York duo Cornfold and Andrews from the Magnet Theatre the first show I did regularly at the Magnet was a duo with a with a woman named Jenny Dunn, and I loved playing with her. And um, I think at our hearts, we wanted to be doing what Lewis and I were doing right now, which is just being characters and letting it be, feel more real. But I think we were too afraid, or I'll speak for myself. I was I felt like I had to be dressed up more, and so we had this form, which which was fun and like was cool to explore, where we like. We're repeating the same scene three times and like we were starting with the same line and responding in a slightly different way. And it was like this kind of weird time travel thing. And I, I, if, if I went back right now and got to play with her again, you know, I think we would probably just do some scenes. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And just let what we liked about playing with each other be the thing that drives the structure or whatever. Um, but I think, yeah, it's easy to feel a lot of pressure. Like you got to, and I think when you're, you know, if you're not, uh, you know, not feeling as confident an improviser, then I think it, it feels like, why, why would people come see me? Like I have to kind of p pitch it. And I think that's, you know, those are concerns. It's like, I've got to kind of like, I've got to promote it to a crowd and maybe to a crowd of people who don't watch improv and like, why would they come see this? And what would it be like? You know, I think those are questions that sometimes get wrapped up with like, what's our form or what's our structure. And, and, uh, and at the end of the day, you, you know, whatever you can do to deliver the best product to people and to, to have the best experience on stage for you, you all is, I think, what you want to start with. Those are valid questions, too. You do have to think about your presentation. Right. And you have to think about, I don't like to think of it in terms of, like, what am I selling people just because that language doesn't do anything for me. But but you do have to factor those those in. Those are important those are important decisions and they're beyond financial decisions and they're beyond practical decisions. They're also important artistic decisions too. What kind of experience do I want people to be having with this show? So edits, formats, numbers of characters, they're technical. What's the magic of two-person improv? What makes it truly special? Rachel Mason. I think like the, the pas de deux, the duet, like when two people come on stage to share the stage together, it's like, it's very special, right? Like the two people singing together in a musical, the two people on stage together in a play, like when we get to improvise and we get to use all of those tools, like, or I say that, or the pas de deux, right? Like, I did I already say, it? anyway, when two yeah. people get to share stage space, it is, um, it's like, it's automatically important. It's like, there's already something going on. Like it's electric. And then you like you and the audience plug in and it's, Oh, I, I mean, I, I can only explain like when I come off stage after Susan and I have performed, like before the shows were always like, what's going to happen. And after the shows were always like, that fucking rolled. Like that was so much fun. What were we worried about? Oh, right. We're together because we belong together. And the audience is here to see us because they love to see us together. And anytime two people are on stage together, like something can happen. 
In New York, just before a show, Scott Adsit and John Lutz reflected on what makes Duo special. It's easier to find just one person. Uh, I was lucky enough to be on a great improv team called Valhalla where we were cultivated and uh, by Liz Allen, who was our coach and teacher, she molded us to be all on the same page and we were, it took a lot of work to do. And I feel like when you find like another person that you're really connected with, it's easier improv. The same thing with like um, Foursquare, which I used to do, which is four people. It was easier because the four of us were all on the same page. Um, and that once you just find those connections, then you just play and you don't have to think about, you don't have to overthink moves at all because you know you're just going to, you've already connected with that yeah, person. It might just be easier. Yeah. For, that, for those reasons. Being easier is an advantage David Pasquese acknowledges too. Well, they're easier to uh, schedule rehearsals. Uh, I'd say that is a not to be uh, scoffed at. That is a, a valuable asset. Um, I, I just what is special about them? I I suppose there's a well, as we were saying before, you're not always in it. So if it, with a larger group, um, and so one of the other things is you're not going to. It's a double edged sword. You're not going to be interrupted, which is nice, but you're also not going to be saved by anyone, which is a added responsibility. And I think those are some of the elements that I like about it, that I, oh yeah, nobody's, nobody's going to come. Nobody's coming. There's no uh, cavalry. Many improvisers start off on a team and then move on to being in a duo. So what advice did Derek's mojo have for people toying with the idea of embarking on a show with a cast of two? For anybody that's thinking, oh, should I do a two-prov? Yes, yes, do it. Because you, because sometimes um, I feel like some barriers for some people, the fact of, oh, there's only two of us, what if we run out of things? You end your show. I'm sure your first two-prov show is not going to be at Wembley and then they're going to sue you because you're supposed to do two hours and you only did 10 minutes. I would say... <laughs> Go go and do it. Find someone that you really enjoy uh, making improv with or you think you might enjoy uh, making improv with and give it a go. It's not like buying a dog. You can let it go <laughs> into the wild and then find another two prov or find find what your jam is. But I feel like if you don't give it a go, especially if you have that spark of like, I think I want to do this thing and you go, oh, no, because of X, Y and Z. No, go for it. Do it, do it, do it. Scott Adsit and John Lutz believe who you're on stage with is everything. I guess just find the right person. Yeah. I think it really is just find it is. It's um because I've done lots of two-person shows. And some people I've connected with more and some people I it just it just, just didn't click. Um there was a person Megan O'Brien who I did a two-person show with in um Chicago where she was just my the person I was supposed to do it with didn't show up so I just picked her up. I said, hey, I know, I knew her, and I was like, let's let's play. And our first show was amazing, and it just clicked for some reason. And then we had a big run of shows that we did together. Mm. Um, and then there are people that I've known for a long time and rehearsed with and done all the, and it just doesn't doesn't necessarily match up. Um, and you could just you can feel that when you're on stage. It's just finding the right person. Yeah, it's it's playing as much as you can, yeah, as often as you can with as many different people as you can. And then, and then, and when you find somebody you really enjoy two-person improv with, you just do it as do it with them if you can. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's, that's that's basically it. Rachel Mason thinks one thing you could do before forming a duo is really invest in some specific skills. I actually think it would be like take like a Meisner class or like a like a real acting class. I think that. I think that duos are like unscripted acting. You have to be able to play different characters and you have to listen on a level that you don't, you have to listen differently than you do in group improv. So I think real acting can help. Or at least, like I said, like a Meisner, like repetition, something that makes you focus on the other person. 
When you take a look at the show notes from this episode, you'll see links to online shows and books from some of the participants you've heard. Whether it's watching a show or buying a book or an online series, it's a really good time to support performers if you're able. Next time on the Improv Chronicle podcast. While improv has made huge efforts to get online in either Zoom or podcast form, musical improv has extra barriers to overcome with technology. And yet, musical improv classes and podcasts are still running. How? The Improv Chronicle podcast is produced and presented by me, Lloydie James Lloyd. Please subscribe and rate us on your favourite podcast app by going to ratethispodcast.com slash improvchronicle. And if you have an idea for a possible future episode, get in touch through improvchronicle.com. Improv